Hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Um, people will be coming trickling in. I have a flyer for you if ha you haven't gotten one just yet. Um, <clears throat> we're very lucky to have Mark join us tonight. He's a Yorktown graduate, a college athlete, and a current sports agent, professional sports agent. And uh, he's going to be sharing a little bit about how to get the right placement for you or your son or daughter in college, uh, not only for hopefully athletics, but more importantly, academics, which should be goal one, okay? And I'm not gonna spoil the show, but um, welcome Mark, please. Thank you, I, I appreciate it. I appreciate Mr. Burrow and, and certainly the opportunity to be here. Um, I think I'll stand more so here. I know that the group is kind of to the right and we've got the camera in the back. So a couple of quick housekeeping points, okay? Traditionally, I don't usually use a microphone. And if I do, it's a lavalier. I really try to engage and use my hands. So I will power through with the microphone tonight, but I'm not the only one that's gonna be speaking. There is going to be some considerable class participation. So for every student who is already slouched in their chair and is probably slouching and getting a little bit lower with me saying that there's gonna be class participation with the students, this, this is for you to a degree. You're gonna tune me out. You probably have already tuned me out. I've probably lost most of the students. For the parents, honestly, I'm a pretty good gauge of when I'm losing an audience. I truly hope you stay dialed in from beginning to end because this is for you. It, it is an education and for most if not all of you, it is going to be an incredible dose of reality that Forget about just the percentages of playing at the college level. I'm hoping to introduce some things that, in my opinion, they are fundamental. They are as simple, common sense approaches to a decision-making process and what happens when the student is on that campus that no one is paying attention to because we are all chasing this incredibly, unfortunately, unrealistic, Division I scholarship. And I'm going a tiny bit out of order, but when I tell you it is going to be incredibly hard to be the worst Division Three player on the worst Division Three team in the country, and that's gonna be a hell of an accomplishment, we're gonna talk about things like that tonight. All right, so rounding out the housekeeping, it is not a coincidence that I chose to pair this white collared shirt with this dark green sweater as a proud Yorktown graduate because you know rivalries still exist. I played on these fields and it doesn't seem like that long ago and I think I'm probably close to the age of a lot of the adults in this room and it doesn't seem that long ago for you either. But I will say that because I grew up here, I went to Yorktown High School and I played truly on these fields. The sexiness of, I'm a major league baseball agent I live on the beach in Manhattan Beach, California. I work for Beverly Hills Sports Council and for five years actually had an office on Rodeo Drive. That all seems like, wow, that's fancy and exciting. I'm not dismissing that it's not, but I'm you. And these students, I'm really you. I was in your position, I don't think that long ago, and fundamentally, I don't think the process has changed that much. I was incredibly fortunate to play four years at a non-scholarship Division II school just outside of Boston, Stonehill College. Some of you might be familiar with it. I did not choose Stonehill College's baseball program. I chose Stonehill College. And tonight is not about me saying, you have to do what I did. This is just my opinion. But I think 22 years in professional baseball with a little bit of college athletics and a whole lot of common sense, including working with and representing some of the best baseball players in the world, I have a very unique perspective to be able to see sports at the highest level all the way down to the high school level. And so knowing what this experience as a sophomore or a junior or a senior did for my college and beyond life, I felt very obligated to create some sort of roadmap. 
for everyone in this room to hopefully apply it to your own situation. Because unlike 25 years ago, it has become incredibly challenging and convoluted with a lot of promises and a lot of unfortunate results. And for every parent in this room who says, I'm doing it for my kid, I'm doing it for him or her, while I agree with that probably philosophy and maybe you mean it, the way it's built now, that same kid we're supposed to be assisting or helping or protecting is the one who is going to be very disappointed come time of being a college freshman. And every step, and when I say every, I truly mean 100% of this process should that kid be disappointed in the end was avoidable. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Okay? So to get started, everybody has the handout. If you don't have the handout, please grab one in the back of the room. And we're really only going to focus on five bullet points, one through five. And that's where the students are really going to start to create our profile. They're going to talk to us. And that is key. We are not listening. They're talking. We're not listening. I'm going to prove it right now. Every student, raise your hand. I got to see everybody. I got to know where you're sitting and stuff because you're going to participate. Not this. This is not raising your hand. As high as you can raise it. Okay, so I have a feel. Everybody has to answer to the following question. There's going to be two options. It's going to be option A or option B. It is that simple. Option A. College coach says to you, you're on our team. Congratulations. You've made the team. But I need to be very, very clear up front. There's no scholarship money. Okay, you're, 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 we're not paying you to be here. You, you've earned the spot, but you're, you're not getting any money. In fact, you're never going to play as a freshman or as a sophomore. You might see the field sparingly as a junior, and we'll get you into some games to reward you as a senior, but you're here to be a practice player. You're a bench warmer to, to be a practice player, and we're happy to have you involved, but that's our offer. That's option A. Option B is, listen, we're going to expect you to come in and compete as a freshman. We think you can start as a sophomore. By the time you're a junior, I see some leadership. You might be a captain. And by the time you graduate as a senior, you might be an all-time record holder. Okay? That's option B. All those students that raise their hand to show me where they are. How many of you, you have to choose one or the other, are taking option A? And how many are taking option B? So it's unanimous. Well... In the example, option A is Division I. And option B is Division II and Division III, which is going to be non-scholarship. Now, I met these kids less than 10 minutes ago. They all just told me where do they want to play athletically in college. They want to play D2. They want to play D3. They want an opportunity to participate. They want to have a chance to actually get on the field and make something of the experience. So who wants to really play Division I more? The students or the parents? Because I just got my answer. And I can guarantee that there's someone in this room and, quite frankly, a whole lot more people out of this room who have it all figured out because their kid's going to D1. And these students just told us where they want to go. I do want to compliment and acknowledge the fact that you're all here because as much as I make that remark the fact that you are here and willing to listen and open your mind to an educational process for the benefit of your child that means a lot to me as a presenter but it truly reflects that you don't know it all and that you really are trying to learn because there is no textbook for this and unfortunately, in a lot of parents, I'm starting to see some nods. You know the parent that I'm referring to. Their kids go in D1. And guess what? Two years from now, your kid's going to be really happy in school, and that kid's going to be in a transfer situation, or it's going to be someone else's fault. The coach screwed me. This happened. That happened. And the parent is going to displace that blame on everybody but themselves. This is on you, mom and dad. And it all starts with the piece of paper you have in your hand. All right, so sports. Sports are about statistics, right? Now, they don't lie. We, we really kind of gauge everything off of stats, 
Stats don't lie. So let me read you some stats. This is the percentage of high school athletes who will earn a spot, earn a spot on a men's or women's Division I team. For football, water polo, field hockey, lacrosse, golf, swimming, track, soccer, and cross country, less than 3% of the high school athletes will earn a spot at a D1 team. Less than 2% for baseball, softball, and tennis, and less than 1% for basketball, wrestling, and volleyball. And that was just to earn a spot. You want to talk about scholarship dollars? That's about half of those percentages. So while I realize someone has to make up for the 1% or the 2 or the 3%, it is not the majority, which is in this room. The problem, and it's an epidemic that exists in everywhere you go involving any sport you play is too many people convinced they're part of those stats. So let's ask a question. All the students, and I don't care if you're a freshman, because the process at the D1 level starts as early as a freshman or a sophomore. For all of the students, has a coach tracked you down in the parking lot after you played a game, after you went to a showcase, after you went to an event, told you how great you were, handed you their card, invited you up to their school, followed up with a phone call, followed up with an email. I'm not talking about being invited to their money-making camp in the summer. I'm talking about an exclusive visit where you're going to sit down with the coaches, meet the players, and maybe even stay overnight. How many of the students have gotten that type of, of uh, engagement? There's always going to be somebody as part of that. One kid raised their hand. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that as we get a little closer. I might have to ask you to move down. Okay? That's being recruited. And the truth is, if they have seen him play, and he happened to go gangbusters, and I, I should throw an asterisk out. By chance, are you a lacrosse player? Okay. This is the asterisk. I grew up in a town dominated by lacrosse. Now, I guess, dominated by football, too, being from Yorktown. Lacrosse was always going to be different in this community, okay? It dominates the landscape. So if 3% in my statistics I just read you was national, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt and multiply it for 5 to 8. I'll give you 15 to 25% of the lacrosse community is maybe in that Division I conversation. 25 years ago, it was a whole lot easier than it is today because even in Southern California, they're playing lacrosse. It's become a little more watered down for the region because the rest of the country's gotten really, really good. So I'm not surprised to have his hand raised specifically for lacrosse. But even then, it's going to be a challenge. And even then, at the Division I level, all programs and schools are not created equal. His experience going to a Maryland with 35,000 students five hours from here is going to be a lot different than, let's say, his experience at Siena College, which is going to be two and a half hours away and have 6,000 students. Let's say they offer them the same athletic scholarship. The principles we'll talk about tonight should still play into a Division I decision. The reality is, with the exception of that young man, none of us are in that Division I conversation, and that's okay because 97% of the athletes out there are not either. And here's the good news. The last thing I want to do is come across as negative. I don't want to come across as bursting anyone's bubble. Bigger, faster, stronger, smarter on the field. That is athleticism and traits that only the athletes in this room can control. If you become that, they will find you. The days of sending clunky VHS cassettes to coaches are over. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all aspects of social media, when I assure you it is impossible to get missed, it is impossible to get missed. The Division I coaches know who you are, and if they are interested, they're going to do what they did to him. So if you are bigger, faster, stronger, smarter, and better than everybody else, they're going to come knocking on your door. In the interim, if you want to play at the next level, you have to be in charge of your own destiny. I'm an agent. Every student in this room is also now an agent. Every student has one client, 
Can anyone guess who their client is? Themselves. And that's what tonight's about. So let's start with this presentation. For the students, somebody raise their hand and read the very first bullet point. What's number one? Right here. Let's just, I'm going to just force you to read it. What's number one? And you should have one of these. So I don't know why you don't have one of these, so I'm going to give you one of these. What's number one say? Say it nice and loud. It says write in student body size. Now, for all of the students, before I have to actually pick on one, Take a guess. What's that mean? What does student, right in student body size mean? Any guesses? I know somebody knows the answer. I mean, let's go. Somebody step up, be a leader. Who's my captain? What does it mean? Nobody knows what right in student body size means. Go ahead. Size of the school. What's right for my student body size? So if we can't get out of the batter's box here with just guessing what it means, I think we're going to have a tough time asking the following question, which is, does anybody have an idea of how big of a school or small of a school they want to go to? For any of the students, everybody raise their hand. Because now I'm just going to start. You guys have left me with no choice but to pick on you. So raise your hand if you're a student. I'm looking at one right now who's not raising his hand, so now he's absolutely getting called on. Back here with the hat. Do you have any? What year are you first off? So, you, oh, so you're, dude, this is your sweet spot. I mean, this is where it gets real. I know you want to go play video games and high five your buddies, but we got to start paying attention on this, okay? Which is a good thing, and that's why you're here. What sport do you play? And that's what you want to play in school? He plays baseball, by the way, and he wants to play it in school. And do you have any idea? And the answer is okay if it's no, because it'll probably help this. Do you have any idea how big of a school you want to go to or small? Smaller, do you know why? No, okay, but it's good. It's good that you at least have a feel. This is how many students, Mr. Burrow, how, how many students are, are in the school? Okay, so I mean 600, 700, so a comfort level type of thing. Do any of the students have an idea of how I wanna go to a big school? Anybody have, have that I wanna go to a big university or no? Okay, and, and that's all right. The, the last uh, session I just did, you know, it was a freshman, and she's like, at least 20,000. Okay, well, for the argument's sake of pretending she was here and said 20,000, for mom and dad, trying to extract this information, which is probably more painstaking for you than it is for me in my first 11 minutes, let's go through some examples. So, bigger school, smaller school. Well, let me run through the bigger school when they say, I want to go to UConn, or I want to go to North Carolina. I think that's great. I wanted to go to North Carolina too when I was in 10th grade. So when you're in front of the room here as the professor and you're on the whiteboard and you're going through this and your class looks exactly like this, 250 students, some kid in the back's like just flailing his arm, it's dying. By the way, students, classes aren't 40 minutes, they're about 80 minutes and you're gonna take three of them a day. So the I'll just sleep through algebra, that's out. This is an 80-minute interactive, if you close your eyes, doze off, daydream, start talking, you're missing that professor doing something up here on the front, and they're not slowing down to take your question. That's a big school. That's a UConn. That's a North Carolina. That's a Maryland. Maybe not every class, but a majority of them. If that is not the right learning environment for you, you're probably not going to a school of 20,000 plus. By contrast, Mom and dad, how big of a school do you want to go to? Uh, I don't really know. Okay, well, would you rather learn in the environment I just described, or would you rather learn in an environment where it's basically the rose all the way back to uh, this gentleman in, in, in the, with the blonde hair who we're interacting, it's 35 students, you raise your hand, yeah, you got a question? Okay, let's talk. That's a school of 5,000 or under, okay? There's a huge difference between those two learning environments. He already told me he wants a smaller school. So why are we focusing on anything bigger than 5,000? We would be setting him up to fail academically by putting him in an environment in which he's uncomfortable. That's number one. This is not that tough. We have not talked about academics or the sport yet. But I can't tell you how many parents 
knowing that he wants a school less than 5,000 when that showcase they spent 500 on or that travel ball team they spent two grand on and some coach comes up, don't care what the sport is and says, you really took uh, an opportunity to, to impress us today. I'm Coach Jones from XYZ University. We're a D3 and we, we could use a, a MIDI. We'd love to have you come uh, check out our campus. And you're like, yes, when? Well, do you even know where it is, how big it is? So let's ask. So well, tell us a little bit about your school. Well, um, we, uh, we have a student body size of 14,000. The conversation ended right there. There's no reason to continue this. This is not 5,000 or less. This is 14. No reason to continue that. Now, there is a little bit of a confidence boost. There's some worthwhile information. If this coach thinks I'm good enough to play at this level, then that's, that's good. Maybe, let's identify other colleges, maybe even within that same conference, that start to fit our profile. But I can't tell you how many parents are running off to that 14,000 person school because all of the time and the investment and the excitement of that opportunity, you've packed up the car and you're on the road. There is no way that student should be even considering that school under that one variable. Somebody read me the second. So go ahead. We're just going to kind of continue. What's the second one say? Okay, this might be a, a, an English uh, question. What does proximity mean? Somebody tell me. What does that mean? Comfortable, comfortable proximity from home. Any guesses? How far from home do you want to be? Now, for this answer, the unacceptable answer, while it might be true, is not as far away from mom and dad as possible. Okay, that's, don't say that, even if you're thinking it. But does anybody have an idea of how far away from Putnam Valley High School do they want to be? Anybody? Any guesses? Does anybody want to go down south and get into the warm weather and just get out of the northeast? Nobody wants, everybody wants to stay kind of close, okay? So I'm going to have to, right here, I'm going to ask you, any idea how far away you want to be? Not too far, but not too close. And these are, <laughs> that's an awesome answer because it's real, okay? So now we have to qualify it, right? We, we have to drill down on that. Now, I think in today's world, that could mean two hours, that could mean five hours, right? So I'll ask you, you're on a trip with your parents, and you're the passenger, and you forgot your phone charger, and there's only so much battery to that phone, okay? It's going to run out at some point. How long is too long in that car for you? Three hours? Four hours? I mean, have you taken a car trip to Baltimore? Or Virginia? Okay. Was that... Were you ready to get out of the car by the time you got to Baltimore? Okay. Have you been up to Boston? Okay. Have you been to Syracuse? Where? Binghamton? And, you know, that wasn't that long of a drive, but it wasn't too short, right? So I'm going to call it three to five hours. I mean, he's in a range, okay? We'll split the difference and call it four hours. His answers are real, but the way I'm asking these questions... That's how you're going to have to probably extract some of this information from your teenage son or daughter who doesn't want to talk to you, okay? I mean, let's just be realistic. So by finding different ways to get the info, and some of it is somewhat painstaking, I can't explain how crucial it is. Because piggybacking on the example I just gave, we are identifying a school of less than 5,000 students that is within four hours of where we are. Now, four hours takes us to Syracuse, out to Altoona, Pennsylvania, down to Baltimore, up to Boston. We have an entire geography, a huge region to choose from. There are going to be literally hundreds of colleges that fit a profile of within four hours under 5,000. We are trying to drill down. That school that had 14,000 students that tapped us on the shoulder after the game that was some small, not small rather, but a D3, is outside of Buffalo. 
So now it's nine hours away in 14,000 14, students, and yet we're like, we'll be there on Saturday, coach, to watch the scrimmage. What a joke. What a waste. You have, and trust me, when they become juniors and certainly into becoming seniors, the amount of time that you have to truly figure out where are we going to invest our opportunities is going to be about this big and that quick. And so really wasting that trip out to Buffalo is going to, to truly put your son or daughter at a disadvantage. They are not expected to know the difference. They gave you two answers. Hey, mom and dad, I want to go to a school with less than 5,000 kids, and I want to be within four hours. Great. We know what we're looking for. What's the third one say? Desired fields of study. Anybody have an idea what that means? Any guesses? Go ahead. What do you want to major in? You have uh, any idea what you want to major in? Criminal justice. You want to be a lawyer or you want to be a cop or what do you want to be? Police officer. Excuse me for saying cop. And, uh, <laughs> I did catch myself in my mind. I'm glad you actually pointed it out. I always try to be a little more respectful of the profession. That's awesome. He knows it. How old are you? 16. Now, most of us at 16 or 26 or even 36 have wanted to do something and have changed vocations plenty of times. He does not have to declare his criminal justice major today or the first day of school. Heck, not even until he is a junior. The likelihood that he might change his mind or say, maybe that is a minor. It's very realistic. But if he wants that as a start-off major, let's make sure that the school has that major. More importantly, what else do you like? Let me ask it this way. What's your best subject? Science. What's your next best subject? If we're ranking science, math, English, and social studies, science is one. What's next? Social studies, okay? There's plenty of schools, all liberal arts schools. They're going to offer bio. They're going to offer chem. They're going to offer, offer applied sciences. They're going to offer history. They're going to offer majors that are in addition to criminal justice. When he comes home on Thanksgiving, and while he might want to be a police officer and is for the first time exposed to a totally different world around totally new people with totally new opportunities, he might say, I've always wanted to do it, but maybe I will go be an FBI forensic expert because I'm really good at science and it's still in criminal law and criminal justice, and I'm going to combine the best of both worlds. That takes him down a very different path. And when he is at Thanksgiving dinner and says, can you pass the mashed potatoes? I'm changing my major. You better be ready for that. And if you are at a school where that backup plan that he is now excited about is not either A, offered, or B, the like right fit, it's not known for it, you didn't do your homework, what else is he interested in? You know what he likes and he interested, is interested in and actually excels at. We need to bridge that gap. We still haven't talked about sports. We are talking about basic fundamentals. So I'm the coach from the school that has 14,000 students that's nine hours away. And actually, you know what? Criminal justice or criminologies are, are not majors we have. Um, we have communications. And we do have science. It's actually biochem. That, that's, that school makes no sense for us. But we packed up the SUV, and we are like halfway across 87. All right, what's the fourth one? Where's my next closest student? What do you got? OK, now this one's a, this one's a different answer for everyone. I, I've got three different answers, but I'm not going to share them until you give me some of yours. And since you read it, I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you, what do you think that means? What's extracurricular? You could stop there, that's good. Clubs, the last class or last session, someone started off with parties, which I suppose is, <laughs> mom and dad, that is a very different extracurricular that I'm sure you are rubbing your forehead over at some point knowing it's coming. But 
Clubs is definitely one. What else are we doing on campus aside from being in a classroom and hopefully being on a field or in a court, okay? Uh, so clubs, absolutely. Anybody else? Tell me extracurricular. What could it mean? Any guesses back here? No guesses? How about internships? I've got news for every student in this room. You're going to pick a major at some point, and they are going to make you go out and get real life, real world experience. It is going to be an internship. Sometimes you could get away with doing it during the summer. Most times it's during the school year. Traditionally, during your junior or your senior year. If you play baseball and they tell you your internship is going to be in your spring semester, three days a week, from eight in the morning until five in the afternoon, guess what you're not doing that spring? Take a guess. Playing baseball. You need the internship to graduate. There's gonna be a real life, real world conflict there and something you need to give strong consideration to. Because mom and dad, I know you love making the drive and going to watch him in the lineup because he bats third and plays right field, but the reality is your $100,000 to $200,000 cash investment over four years requires him to go take this internship to get him into the real world and basically the cord cut to be an adult. Real life, real world stuff. Clubs, internships. I'll give you one that probably people aren't thinking about. For every single student here, another mandatory, you have to raise your hand. How many of you like to ski and snowboard? Nice and high. Four or five, okay. How many of you like to play beach volleyball or golf or play tennis, you know, like outdoor activities? Okay, another three or four. You guys like to do nothing. You like to just text and watch Netflix, right? Okay, just clarifying. Um, I'm just teasing you guys. Um, there we go, perfect. Uh, the forensic science, we're just attaching it all together. Um, so of the people, did anyone put their hand up for both? Who put their hand up for both? Okay, so given the choice for you two guys, what would you rather, hey, we're gonna go this weekend. We're gonna go ski or snowboard, or we're gonna go uh, play some golf in the morning and then come back and we're gonna play some beach volleyball. What would you rather do? All right, he's ski or snowboard, what are you? Okay, using this example, I consider that an extracurricular. Why? Because they're 15 or 16 or 17 now. They'll be 18 as freshmen. They're not gonna stay freshmen and be 18 forever. They are eventually going to gain more and more independence. They are going to wanna to get off of campus. They're going to wanna blow off steam. They are going to make new friends and have new experiences. And oh, by the way, you can't control either one of those variables. Those friends, you don't know them. And what they're telling you they're doing and what they're really doing are probably two different tales. Things you can no longer control. So if you know that they love to ski and snowboard, that to me, that's a pretty safe environment. That's something they have a passion for. That's something that could be that getaway and really actually accelerate that college enjoyment experience. So if we know that, why are we looking and considering schools that are in Western Maryland when the same type of school that fits our profile is in the Adirondack Mountains or up in uh, you know, northern New Hampshire? That 40-minute drive to the mountains opposed to the four-and-a-half-hour drive to the mountains, they're going regardless. Which would you rather have them do? Drive 40 minutes to that mountain back and forth? the next four years or for four and a half with a bunch of kids you don't know. And it's something that they want to do. They enjoy it, it's part of their DNA. That's an extracurricular that should be considered. So again, circling back, less than 5,000, under four hours, has the criminal justice and science and history, all majors we're looking for, offers internships, is probably close to the mountains. We're still, in a hundreds of colleges, certainly dozens, but hundreds of colleges, we could still draw a map and say, this is where we're going. It might be, hey, there's a huge difference between Boston, Hartford, Manchester, New Hampshire, Portland, Maine, Albany, New York. 
Those are five very, very different cities. The experience of going to college in those five cities, very different. The people that you will be around, down to the food you'll eat, will be very different. Another extracurricular variable that should be just brought into that equation of streamlining the process. We still haven't talked about the sport. And the reason why those four criteria are just so amazingly important is because of the sport. I already said, you are going to be your own agents. The coach isn't going to call, nor should they. The athletic director isn't going to call, nor should they. Not at this part of the process. They have a responsibility, and we'll get to that point. But that's truly at the end. You're pitching innings one through eight. They come in as the closer in the ninth. Mom and dad, it's not your job to call that coach and sell your son or daughter to be a college athlete. It is their job. They are an agent of themselves. And we now live in a world, in an era, where I don't know how you got there, but they're incapable of looking people in the eye and having a conversation. They can't even pick up the phone and talk. I remember I asked one kid, well, what happened if you were going to ask a girl on a date? He said, I text her. I mean, that's the world we live in. No one's picking up the phone anymore. But this is a job interview. This is the first real job interview that every one of these student athletes are going to have. And if you can't look a coach in the face, shake their hand, carry a conversation, they are going to be your surrogate parent for the next four years. Do they want to carry around the kid, I don't care how good they are, that is always complaining about being homesick, about, you know, he's, he's hanging out and, and, and drinking, or late for class, late for practice, uh, tweeting inappropriately, whatever. They do not have enough time in the day. They are not full-time. Their assistants are not full-time. They have their own lives, their own families, and they just want to coach. But with that comes a level of responsibility of being in charge of 15 or 20 or 30 kids. You're that kid, they will cut you. Why? Because there's no money invested in you because you're not a scholarship player, so they'll just pick the next kid. If you think that the process of as simple as going to the school and meeting the coach for the first time before or after their practice is just to be like, well, you know, we'll see how it goes, you're going to fail. And that might get you cut from the team before you even step foot on campus. Which leads me to another point. Every single player has to try out. I don't care what the coach promised you, you are trying out. There is no spot guaranteed unless they are paying you to be there. Why? Well, for starters, the coach might not even be there by the time you arrive. They're not looking to stay at Cortland State the next 30 years. They're looking to go from Cortland State to Siena to Boston College to Virginia Tech and run the program at South Carolina 15 years from now. That's their goal. That's their dream. Also, that coach that may have driven four hours down from Manchester, New Hampshire on a Saturday to watch you play in some small conference 600-person game? Think that's the head coach? No shot. That is a graduate assistant who has zero decision-making say in the end. Is basically qualifying how interested you are and vice versa. And that's at a best case scenario. So the fact that they're like, you're our starting shortstop, you're our starting midi, you're going to be our starting point guard, that means nothing. So to not think you have to try out, to think that spot's guaranteed, you are sorely mistaken. And again, I'm not trying to be negative. I'm trying to be realistic. There was one statistic I didn't share at the beginning. I'll use baseball as an example only because it's actually the best chances. All of the other sports that I mentioned at the beginning have lower chances. There are 130,000 high school baseball seniors coast to coast playing right now. They'll play this spring. 
and only 9,800 of them will go on to college. When I say go on to college, I mean D1, D2, D3, and an NAIA classification, which is incredibly, incredibly popular in the Midwest. It's kind of like a D2, D3 type of combined thing. That's 7.5% of all the high school seniors playing baseball right now that will play at any level in college. Better said, 92.5% of those kids will not play in college. The percentages only get worse for the other sports, which is why I use baseball as an example. You show up, and there's going to be 41 kids trying out, 18 kids trying out, 22 kids trying out. You're an 18-year-old freshman competing against 20 and 21-year-old men and women who are bigger and faster and stronger and more experienced than you, who are going to try to stick it to you, who are going to try to embarrass you. It'll be the biggest, hardest athletic jump of your life. And you're doing it under a microscope of a five-week audition to try to make a team that's going to take four spots and there's 22 kids. That's reality. Oh, and that's at the worst Division Three team in New England. It's reality. So the, I'll just play D3. Maybe. This is the state of the real union. And I won't even waste time talking about the fairy tale called a Division I scholarship. I'm just trying to help you get a roster spot on a D3 team. And not only that, at a school that fits those first four criteria, because this is every student athlete's job since we've identified as a group those four criteria. I can grab my phone and we can arbitrarily pick any college and we can find the coach's phone number and email on a Google search in less than three minutes. You want to spend $29.95 and join collegiate directories? I can't advocate that enough. It'll be the best $30 you ever spent because it has the contact information on a very easy to use kind of sort filter type of uh, website that will truly give you every coach's name to every sport, their phone, their email address, the address, the nickname of the mascot, everything you can think of for $30. And it is the student's responsibility to call the coach and leave a voicemail. They're not going to answer because they're probably not even there. Then you're going to follow up that phone call with an email. Basically reiterating what you just said. If you have to jot it down, script it out, practice it in the shower or in the car or wherever you need to, you do that. Hit pound and start it over if you felt it sounded awful. But that is your job. You are selling your one client to that coach, you. And here is a real life, real world analogy. For the parents, if you were going to go buy a $100,000 vehicle, you weren't set on what brand, but you knew you wanted a $100,000 SUV. You checked out Mercedes and BMW, uh, Infiniti, Audi, Lexus. You went to all of them. But you didn't really know which one you were going to buy. You just knew you wanted it in black. You're going to go test drive that car, and you are going to painstakingly go through every single detail on that investment. I don't like the way the back interior looks, the way the sun comes through the driver's side window. Maybe I won't get this car. But for the $200,000 investment you'll make on their education, we'll ignore incredibly important factors. Bringing it back to them, it is a buyer's market. You can buy any car you want. You've got the hundred grand, and you're going to go buy a car. They can go anywhere they want, providing their academics get them in, and your money qualifies them to pay for it. It's a buyer's market. Don't forget that. You control the deck. You control the conversation and the information with the coaches. They need you more than you need them. 
but we are so excited to have the one coach from Buffalo show us some attention, and we're like nervous around him. It's ridiculous. It's your world, it's your academics, it's your money, it's your purchase. You think us trying to get, I don't know, Alex Cobb, who's very interested in, in, in New York, 50, 60, 70 million being the business of baseball and why your Yankee tickets go up $3? You wanna talk about business? College, the cost, the associated, all the, I almost swore, all of the other things that go along with what you are spending your money on right now, thinking it's going to lead to some sort of athletic scholarship. That's a business. And so don't lose sight. And so when they pick up the phone and say, Hi, Coach Bowen. This is Mark Lineweaver from Yorktown High School. I wanted to reach out and introduce myself because I'm very interested in Stonehill College. I am from uh, Yorktown, New York, about three hours away, which is the perfect distance for me. I'm very interested in studying communications. I have a 3.14 GPA. I have a 27 on my ACTs. And I am the starting catcher on my high school baseball team. My family and I are heading up to Boston in about two weeks. And we would love to come tour Stonehill uh, in the early afternoon. And if you had a few minutes afterward, I'd love to put a face with a name to come catch a practice or maybe just meet with you in, in your office. My cell phone number is thanks so much for the opportunity and I look forward to hearing from you. That voicemail now becomes almost word for word an email. If you were going to walk into the car dealership, I'm going to show you how it's not going to go. Hey, I like that X5 out there. Can you toss me the keys? Because I'm going to take it for a test drive, and I'll be back in an hour. Th that's not realistic. OK. Hey, 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 hang on. Sit down. Fill out this paperwork. We're going to run your credit. We're going to make sure that you have the money to buy this car. We're going to check your license that you don't have nine DUIs. We're going um, to qualify you. We're going to qualify you. She just left an incredibly qualified voicemail to earn a phone call back from that coach who gets hundreds of emails, more times than not from paid services that assure you for $3,000 they're going to have your kid play somewhere in college. They did their job. They got you that school out there in Buffalo. And you're like, well, this doesn't fit. Well, you gave us three grand to find you a school. You said you wanted to play in college. There's no refunds. I did my job, OK? They're getting those emails. You left a very qualified voicemail, attached it to a qualified email. And when they didn't call back, not because they're not interested, they don't know you. They just don't have the time or the resources because they're not full-time. The assistants don't even have the ability to get the emails on their phone. They have to remote log in when they're in the office, as limited as that might be. And when they do open their inbox, there's 137 emails. So you have to call again. You have to email again. I don't care if it's word for word, the same messages. They will call you back. Why? Because you're showing them you're serious. And in reality, they know that Stonehill's not the only player in this. You're looking at three or four or five other schools that are what? Under 5,000 within four hours that have those majors and offer to those extracurriculars. That's where the business part comes in. They want that student. And let's hope they really want that student athlete. That to me, the recruiting portion of this seminar, you have to recruit yourself only, and I'll say it again, only after you identify those four, four criteria. And then you're going to cross your fingers that when you do go on that trip to Stonehill and that coach does give you 10 or 15 minutes of their time in their office, you are buttoned up, prepared, and ready to go. They don't want to talk about stats or what position you play. Why? Because there's 600 kids in the school, and there's 3,000 at New Rochelle. So you're all league here. I'll argue you get cut from the New Rochelle team. Stats don't matter in high school. They also don't care about the position, because you play center. They've got a freshman center and a junior center. You're not going to play center. 
So I hope you're athletic enough and versatile enough to play somewhere else. They want to talk about why am I going to babysit you for the next four years? Why do you want to come to this college? Why, inevitably, should I have to cut you from the team because you were completely overmatched, because you dove for a ball on day three of tryouts and twisted your knee, and one of the other kids who wasn't on our radar screen just went gangbusters and we took them instead? Are you happy enough and comfortable enough as a group to want to stay at that college? There should be no reason under any circumstance in the variables we're discussing for this student to transfer. Sometimes you're just not good enough. And if you didn't lay eyes on that athletic program when you had close to two years to go visit it, I didn't know they were going to be that good. I didn't know that coach was going to turn into a total jerk. You should have gone to more games. You should have asked more questions. I didn't know this car had halogen lights. You test drove it at night. How did you not know that? I mean, the lack of accountability and responsibility in this process is overwhelming. I'm not yelling at the people in this room, although it definitely seems that way, but I think everyone in this room can understand that there are so many more factors involved than just thinking someone's going to show up because they might, and they're probably going to be from Buffalo at a school that doesn't fit. So once we dialogue with the coach, once that audition or job interview begins, because we qualified ourselves and we wrote down reasonable, proper questions of what to ask and what expected to be asked. What do you want to study? Why do you want to come here? Where do you see yourself in five years? What type of leader are you? Tell me what you do well. You know what's a really hard question to ask? I'll, I'll, I'm going to put you on a spot because you're doing so great. What's your name? What is it, Ryan or Brian? With an R? Let's give a round of applause for Ryan because he's doing great and we're picking on him. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you do a lot of things well. I'm, I'm also guessing that your biggest fan can tell me what you do well. What don't you do well? What do you need to work on? What's your biggest area of improvement? I don't mean on the field. I mean in life. It's hard. You know what's not hard? Talking about all the things you do well. Mom, what's he need to work on the most? Where is his biggest area of improvement? Communication. Although he's doing pretty well tonight. Communication, listening, being on time, whatever. These are the types of questions they're going to ask. Why am I going to invest that roster spot, but more importantly, babysit you for the next four years? And Depending upon how you answer to those, wow, this kid's pretty sharp. I hope he's half the player he is as a person because this could be a captain of mine. He might not be the best player, but he'll be that really responsible, really reasonable. If something goes wrong, I can rely on him to pick the team up. Not everyone's a stud. There's 20 kids on a team. Two, maybe three are like really good. Like you say, like those are the best players. How'd the other 17 make the team? I don't care if it's here or if it's even at Division I. Why doesn't everybody get drafted? Because there's only four or five kids on a 35-person Division I team that are good enough to get drafted. There are so many different ways to make a team. And in my opinion, that process starts with that first meeting. So when the coach does call and you don't recognize the number and it's a 410 number, and that's Baltimore, and you met a friend two years ago at a camp from Baltimore, and you assume that it's their new cell, and you're like, ah, what's up, what are you doing? And they're like, this is Coach Jones from Stonehill. You just cut yourself from the team. When you tweeted something, because you've already started the process and the coach is interested, and so they're going to put one of their assistants on like, hey, I think this is a kid we want to keep an eye on. He's going to apply, and I have a hunch that they're going to get in. Keep an eye on that kid. Hey, did you see what this kid just tweeted? You just cut yourself. You're not even on the campus yet to try out. You've just cut yourself from the team. By the way, from a Twitter perspective, if you have to think about should I tweet this or not, the answer is don't tweet it, just to make that clear. 
So is everybody with me? And, and I'm going to open it up for questions at some point, but is everybody with me about like, this isn't getting recruited. Like, are we understanding how we are going to dialogue, how we get in touch with the coach, how to qualify ourselves, the hot buttons to say in the hope that they call us back, which they will. They will call you back. You might have to call once or twice, email once or twice. If there's four coaches on staff and there's four cell phones or four office lines and four email addresses, call all four. And if it's a school you really, really like and nobody's getting back to you, call the associate athletic director. It's not a question of tattling. You're coming up. You want to meet them. Hey, Mr. Mr. Uh, associate athletic director, I'm not sure, we've left a message or two, and I get that they're probably super busy, maybe the emails are down, you know, the apology call. You, you don't throw them under the bus, you, you kind of make some room, even though it's like, come on, dude, you gotta be calling me back. But I just wanted to double check, because we're coming up. I, I gotta be honest, and, and this story was brutal. It actually happened at Stonehill where I went, and I was trying to help a student athlete. She went 0 for 3, and I said, you know what, let me make a call. I called the associate AD. The softball coach had cancer. Do I think there should have been some sort of outgoing message or email? Yeah. I'm sure that's not what Stonehill was worried about when they found out that their softball coach got cancer. But they were super apologetic and they were like, when they come up, come see me. We're, we're fielding, we're the interim softball coach for, for this process. You just never know. But you do have to be aggressive in this process. Because you control your own destiny, you're your own agent student athlete, and you need to put this in your own hands. All right, I want to segue a tiny bit into the A, B, and C toward the bottom of your page. Then I will take some questions, and then we will wrap it up. For A, I'm actually going to steal one of these from you guys, all right? Because I want to keep this moving. Financially investing in academics, okay, 10% to a class or a tutor versus a showcase or a club team. Now, I, I think it's pretty reasonable to say that there are people in this room or in this community that have spent at least $10,000 all told uh, on these endeavors. And that includes the, the entry fee and the travel and the lodging and the food and not just in eighth grade year, but ninth grade year and 10th grade year. It, it adds up to 10 grand. And that's probably being conservative. I'm asking you to take 10%, a measly $1,000, and apply it to something a little more practical. Because I think we established tonight they're not going to get an athletic scholarship. And you know what? If they do, great. You'll know if they come and offer you an athletic scholarship. So by getting them that tutor that takes them from a 3-1 to a 3-4, from a 26 to a 29 in the ACT. That could be the difference of getting $3,000 in academic aid to $12,000 in academic aid. Merit scholarships. This is something I can't press enough. Instead of going to another fruitless showcase in Providence, Rhode Island sometime in June, how about we use that time and volunteer our weekend working with special needs kids who have their own baseball or soccer or softball league and don't want donations from adults feeling guilty. They want able-bodied student athletes to come down and play and participate and help out that cause. You want your application to jump off of a page? Get yourself involved with something as simple as that, which is actually on the same playing field that you spend so much time on. You might find it rewarding. Make a new friend. Don't do it because they might give you $15,000 in merit money. Do it because it's the right thing to do. Those kids did not choose to be special needs. Now, who's the math major in here? Who's really good at math? Raise your hand. Because you know there's a loaded question coming. I need, who knows how to count? Anyone know how to count? No, you're done, Ryan. You're too good. Okay, I'm going to put you on the spot. What year are you? Sophomore. Do 10 dimes and a $1 bill have the same dollar value? Yes. Thank God you said yes. Okay, we're all very, very relieved you said yes. So round of applause for her saying yes. She got it. 
Now, here's the second part of that equation. If I put 10 dimes here, and I put a $1 bill here, and I said, grab a dollar, we're going to go down to the 7-Eleven uh, and buy a Snickers bar, I can tell you what you're not going to do. You're not going to do You're going to grab the dollar, and we're going to go. But if we took the 10 dimes to the 7-Eleven, we could buy the Snickers bar. It still counts as a dollar. The merit and the academic money play the same way as the scholarship money that you're not going to get. That investment of $1,000 when you're still, in my opinion, wasting nine grand might actually result in five or 10 or $15,000, let's take this off the bill that you get every year. It plays the same way. Yet we are not investing, most people, anything into considering that because we're still waiting for the scholarship ferry to show up at a game. The wrong scholarship. That's number one. B is basically the point I just made to A. And C, and this to me, th this is the, the bottom line. This is the take home. Getting cut doesn't mean that your college athletic career is over. Now, let me ask a question. This has really nothing to do with the presentation, but how many of the students, this is definitely, a, you have to raise your hand if you really want to do it so I could see it. How many people would like to work in sports for their life? Who would like to have a job in sports? The general manager of the team, the broadcaster, the athletic director at the school, the agent, who would want to work in sports? Two or three, okay? It's a real thing now. I can tell you that when I hire potential interns or, or agents, I'm more interested if they work for the team than if they played for the team. And, and it could be the water polo team or the tennis team or the bowling team. It doesn't have to be baseball, basketball, football, soccer, hockey. You show up to that tryout and you get cut. If you really love the sport that much, if you really think it needs to be part of your college experience, if you go knock on that coach's door the next day, that same coach that isn't full-time, that is overworked, understaffed, underpaid, and you are willing to work for free. Coach, I know you cut me, but I am willing to help out in any capacity. You need me to pick up the balls after practice and put them in the net. You need me to help coordinate the travel for next year's schedule. You need me to keep the statistics, do the scouting reports, hand out the meal money, whatever. I'm there to do it. Realistically, there aren't too many freshmen that truly see the field as freshmen. So if you made the team, you're probably not missing that much. But we're pretending you didn't make the team. If you come knocking on the door with that type of offer, you are going to be associated with that team. They are going to put you to work, and you are going to be as much of a member of that team, if not more, because you'll be a part of the staff. And if you fast forward your life 11 months from that same moment and you try out again as a sophomore after being around the team the entire year, getting to know the players, certainly getting to know the coaches, and oh, by the year, way, you're a year older, a year more mature, probably a little more athletic, probably a little more in a position to make a team. Do you think your chances have improved to make the team or worsened versus the kid that just decided to not be around for 11 months and try again the next year. Do your chances increase or decrease? Answer. I think they increase. So just because you got cut as a freshman, there are alternatives. And I don't think enough people either A, realize it, or B, know that it is an availability. And when you go on that tour and you start asking the coach, so how many kids try out a year? 30. How many do you usually take? Five. What happens with the other 25? They get cut. How many do you actually see ever again? Not many. Would you be open to taking a kid who did get cut that really wants to be involved as an assistant, putting them to work, giving them an opportunity? You can get your answer before you even apply to the college. That could be very, very welcoming and refreshing should the sky fall and I get cut information to fall back on, all right? Um, I'm gonna take some questions, and before I do, I should probably quick hit some of these, all right? 
You know what? I'll quick hit some of these while... Ryan, come on, man. You, you get the MVP award tonight. You can grab somebody. I need everybody to have one of these, okay? And you can, you can hand them off to another student, All right? So here are some quick hits. And some of them I've already mentioned, but I write them down so I don't forget. Measure your talent. Go see a game or a practice live. We talked about it. Don't expect, if we run out, just let me know. Don't expect that you're just going to show up and because it's just D3, well, I'll just go play D3. Trust me, they're really, really good. And it's going to be really hard to make the team. So some schools, you're just not going to be good enough. And you're going to be honest with your own two eyes and say, I love this college, but it might be a long shot to play here. So I should know that going in. That, that is something that you should know as a junior or as a senior long before you get there. What a coach might ask or what you should be asking a coach. At the bottom of everyone's handout is a website. That's my website. This is like my little endeavor on the side of being some fancy sports agent where those of you who have seen Jerry Maguire, there are no Jerry Maguires. I'm Bob Sugar, and Bob Sugar was a pretty good agent. But the thanklessness and the 24-7 of it is very real. And I would invest way more of my time and effort and energy uh, in something like this, uh, probably given the opportunity, but at the same time, I still like to make it available and try to either A, serve as a resource, or at a minimum, come in and do something like this presentation, because I truly believe that every single person in this room can do it on their own. You don't need me. You certainly don't need any one of those services that I've referenced prior. The bottom line is, everyone is equipped to do this on their own. So go to the website, there's a lot of great frequently asked questions, and there's a bunch that you could and should be asking. Uh, just play Division Two or Division Three. I think we covered that. It's gonna be hard to make those teams, and here's a very, very popular one. Do I need a video? Well, I could tell you that the coach is gonna ask you to send a video. When you start that correspondence, they're gonna ask you, do you have a video? And you're going to have to say yes. Now, does that mean you got to go spend $1,000 on some propaganda video sent to fancy graphics and music? No. Who's got an iPhone? Don't even bother raising your hand. You all do. Who has an iPad? Or if you decided to be one of those seven people in the country that has an Android, you, you'd still have video. You still have video. So go out onto the field, onto the court, and take some video. You know what coaches generally don't want to see? Game film. Football might be an exception, but I can't tell you how many players don't do the fundamentals correctly in that super sexy, super flashy game film. You think it's the best play, but they may have done everything wrong. You go show me a player repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat in practice, I'm still a coach and a teacher. I want to see what type of fundamentals you have. And I'm not expecting the greatest player ever because I know you're 16 or 17. Anyone can take 30 seconds of that, of one and then something else and then something else. Three emails with a 30-second attachment is going to go through from your iPhone like that. And they're expecting it. They asked for it. Here's another thing. Coach says, send me a video. What should your response be? For the purposes of time, I'll give you the answer. What do you want to see? Because Coach A might have a very different answer than Coach B. It's just another video to take. But you are an agent, and you're in a negotiation. The more questions you can ask, the more answers you can get, the better off you are going to be. That's what we're trying to do here. Don't waste your money on a video. You've already filled out a profile. You gave it to them in your qualification your prereq, the one that allowed you to start this dialogue. The video, it's that simple. So everyone has a picture in their hand. And when I tell you that this has nothing to do with the presentation, it, it really has little to do with the presentation. But I'll even let the, the parents jump in on this. When I said that I want everybody to be a part of this tonight, I want everybody to describe the individual in front of you on that picture. And there's the ruthlessness. I almost hope it, it, it elevates. Describe that kid. D don't be politically correct. 
Describe that kid if you saw him or someone saw him walking down the hallway in this building. What would you say about that kid? What's that? Fat. What else? Well, happy is not really where we're going, but sure, he was pretty happy. Yeah, aside from the sports, let's just kind of be mean kids, which is going to be most adolescents. This kid's fat. Look at his glasses. What a dork. What a geek. Look at that outfit. Who wears that half shirt? He's probably from Yorktown. And he is. And the reason I bring that picture up is because 30 years ago, oh, 30 years ago, 30 years ago, that kid heard all of those things. Now he's standing here. But the point is that bullying and names and being picked on or having to deal with issues like that, it was a lot easier then. It was one-on-one. -on -one, it was in the confines of a building or a field. And it was easy to handle. I'm not advocating violence at all, but back then you could say, great. Nice that you think that. Now I'm going to kick your ass. I mean, you could do that then. You can't do that now. Why? Because of Twitter. Because of Facebook. Because of phones. Because of social media. Because of a faceless monster that is destroying the self-esteem of kids all over this country. And for those of you who are familiar with the show, 13 Reasons Why, we know how that story ended. And that is not a problem. It is an epidemic sweeping the nation, and it starts in these buildings. And I will tell you that if you really paid attention to that show, there was a theme. The athlete. The athlete seemed to be the problem. So if you want to be an athlete, if you want to be a leader, your job and in my opinion, responsibility is to ensure that those types of things do not go on. That the ones who are weak or struggle or get picked on get defended by you. That is your job. And if you are part of the problem and one of those individuals making those remarks, well, aside from you better knock it off right away, let me enlighten you on something called karma or what goes around comes around. Because while you might be the big man or lady on campus, you wanna go be a college athlete? The world resets the moment you're a freshman on a campus and you're around adults who are going to destroy you. And you are not gonna have help and you are not gonna be wanted to be treated like that and you are gonna be fairly, fairly helpless. You wouldn't want it done to you. Do not do it to someone else. It is a problem. You have a responsibility to be a leader and ensure that those types of things don't happen. Be part of the problem. That's your problem. Be part of the solution. That is your responsibility as a student athlete. All right. I will take any questions. That is the end of the presentation. If anybody has any questions, please. No questions at all? Okay, all of my contact information is on that website. You can email me, you can call me. Don't text me because it goes to my landline that gets transferred to my cell phone. But I am happy to speak or correspond with anyone. I genuinely appreciate the opportunity. I hope I didn't bore you too much. And thanks so much for having me. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, as always, uh, the athletic department is always available uh, for questions and, and any of your uh, things that will come up over the next few years in regards to playing at college, academics, and anything like that. Please don't be shy. There's a lot of false information or lack of information out there, as you can see. Um, but it, it is up to you to go in and, and go after it. Okay? So let us help you do that. But but get on it, get after it. It's, it's for you, for your son, daughter, and they deserve it. All right, thank you so much.